In this lesson, we're going to expand our look at organic nomenclature, learning how to name compounds from a variety of different functional groups. So the first class of compounds we're going to learn how to name are alkyl halides. An alkyl halide is really just an alkane that has a halogen as a substituent. Now the halogen substituent itself is actually named by taking the halogen name, say fluorine, and dropping the I-N-E and replacing it with an O. So fluorine becomes fluoro, chlorine becomes chloro, etc. Now in all other ways, halogen groups are treated exactly like alkyl groups, and the process is the same as naming an alkane. The first step is to always find that parent chain. So if you look at this first example, the longest carbon chain is that two carbon chain. So this is going to be an ethane derivative, but you can see that we've replaced one of the hydrogens on ethane with a bromine. Well, the substituent name for bromine is bromo, so we simply place that in front of the parent name. So this is bromoethane. We do need to number the carbons of the parent chain, again, starting from the end that is closest to the substituent. So in this case, the one carbon would be the carbon bonded to the bromine and then the two carbon next to it. Again, you'll notice that there's no one in the name. I didn't say one bromoethane. It's okay to do that, but again, there's no such thing as two bromoethane. And since there's no ambiguity, most chemists simply don't place the one in the name. But again, remember that halogen groups are treated exactly like alkyl groups. There's no special preferential treatment or anything. So look at this next example. Always go back to the beginning of the process for naming compounds. Find that parent chain. In this case, the longest carbon chain is a five carbon chain. And then we would number that chain starting from the end that is closer to a substituent. It doesn't matter what kind of substituent, right? Just a substituent. So in this case, we can get to that fluorine substituent quickly by starting on the top left. We number the carbons sequentially, and we can see that the fluorine is on two, and we have a methyl group now on three. From there, we simply place those two substituents, each with their locant, listing them alphabetically just like we did with alkyl groups, and then all that before the parent chain name. So in this case, we get 2-fluoro-3-methyl-pentane. Next, we're going to take a look at ethers. An ether is really an alkane that has an alkoxy substituent. An alkoxy substituent is really like an alkyl substituent, except that it's bonded through an oxygen to the actual parent chain. In fact, alkoxy groups are kind of named that way. You name it as though it were an alkyl group, and then change the ending instead of YL to OXY. So alkyl, like methyl, becomes alkoxy, like methoxy. Another way to think of ethers is an oxygen bonded to two alkyl groups. Look at this first example. We've got an oxygen, and on one side of it, a propyl group, and on the other side of it, an ethyl group. In fact, that's how they used to be named. But we're going to learn the IUPAC, the, the systematic way of naming these. Again, the first step in any naming is to find the parent chain. You're pretty much guaranteed to have two separate carbon chains in an ether. So in this case, the longer carbon chain is that three carbon chain on the left. So this is going to be a substituted propane. We would then number the carbons of that chain, starting on an end that is closer to a substituent. And the substituent here is that ethoxy group, right? The ethyl group that also has an oxygen that bonds it back to the parent chain. So we have an ethoxy group bonded to the propane, and that means that the one carbon is going to be the carbon that bears that substituent. So we number one, two, three, going right to left. And that means we simply have one ethoxy propane. Again, the ethoxy substituent name is placed in front of the parent chain name with its locant. Just like with halogen substituents, alkoxy substituents are treated exactly like alkyl groups. There's no preferential treatment with these. So let's look at this example. Again, find the parent chain. In this case, we can see that the longest carbon chain is a five carbon chain. We then number the carbon chain, starting from the end that is closer to a substituent. So in this case, we're gonna go from left to right. And we can see that our alkoxy group, right? It's really just a methyl group with an extra oxygen that bonds it back to the parent chain. So this is going to be a methoxy group. So here we have two methoxy pentane. So the remaining functional groups we're gonna look at naming are actually treated quite a bit differently than the alkyl halides and the ethers we just looked at. The first of these is going to be alcohols. An alcohol really is just an alkane that has a hydroxy group. And unlike the other groups that we've seen, the halogens and the alkoxy groups, an alcohol is actually indicated in a name using a suffix, in this case, O-L. So we drop the E from the alkane name and add O-L to say that it is an alcohol. So look at this simple molecule here, right? We can see that the parent chain is going to be a two carbon chain, that's always the first step. We number the carbons starting on the end that is closer to that functional group. In this case, the rightmost carbon actually bears the functional group, so that gets the one and the other carbon the two. 
So it's a two carbon chain, it's an ethane derivative, it's an alcohol. So we drop the E, add OL, and we have ethanol. This is the booze molecule. Look at the second example. Again, find the parent chain, and it's a five carbon chain. We number the parent chain, starting from the end that is closer to that functionality, in this case going left to right, and that means that we have the OH group, the alcohol, on two. So a five carbon chain is pentane, we have a two pentanol. Notice that the locant for the actual substituent, the hydroxy group, the all, notice that that locant is actually placed before the parent name. It's not really placed in front of the whole name, it's just placed in front of the parent name. So two pentanol. There is an alternative way to do this. You can also put the two directly in front of that suffix, right in front of the OL. So while most chemists would say two pentanol, it's actually more technically correct to say pentane two all. But since it's harder to say, most chemists even now simply rely on saying two pentanol. But either way is technically acceptable. Now there are a couple of new rules we have to worry about with these suffix modifying groups like alcohols. The first modification to our original rules from alkanes is that the parent chain must contain the carbon that bears that suffix modifying OH. So look at this example. At first glance, you would say, oh, the parent chain is going to be the longest carbon chain. And that looks like one, two, three, four, five, a five carbon chain. Notice that none of those five carbons actually are connected to the OH. So when you have a suffix modifying group, yeah, that's not gonna be the case. The longest carbon chain that actually is attached to the OH is the parent chain. And that means that the parent chain here is actually going to be four carbons, the four carbons going left to right. So yeah, it's actually shorter than the total longest chain. So once we know that the parent chain is this four carbon chain, we number the carbons of that chain, again, starting from the end that is closer to the suffix group. And that means that we're gonna start from the rightmost carbon, giving that a one, and then two, three, four. And then after that, it's pretty straightforward. We can see that we have an ethyl group attached to carbon two, and that the OH is attached to carbon one. We place the substituent name with its locant in front, so that's two ethyl, and then one butanol, to note that the alcohol is on the one carbon of a four carbon chain. Another difference with alcohols and other suffix modifying groups compared to our prefix groups like alkyl groups and halogens is that suffix modifying groups have a numbering priority compared to the prefix modifying groups. Look at this example you can quickly see that it's a four carbon chain. So it's gonna be a butane, and it's got an alcohol and a chlorine, so it's got a halogen. The new thing now is in numbering that parent chain. You'd probably be tempted to start from the rightmost carbon because that's the end that is closer to a substituent, right? In fact, it, it has a substituent, the chlorine. If we were to call that rightmost carbon the one carbon, that would make the alcohol on the three carbon. But alcohols, as suffix modifying groups, have a prioritization in numbering the carbon chain. We have to give it the lowest number possible, but again, we have to start numbering on the ends of the chain. And that means that if we started on the left, on the leftmost carbon, that would place the alcohol on two, and two is lower than the three we would have gotten by starting the numbering from the far right. So we actually number it from left to right in this case. We can see that the chlorine is now on four and the alcohol is on two. So here we have four chloro, two butanol. So this is a rule that's pretty easy to overlook. When you have suffix modifying groups like alcohols, you have to give them priority in numbering over all the prefix type groups. Now, don't just start on the carbon. Don't start your numbering on the carbon that bears the OH. Remember, you still have to start your numbering on the ends of the chain. It's just that in this case, we would get to the alcohol more quickly by starting on the left. Even though that puts the chlorine on four, it gives the alcohol the lower number two, rather than the three we would have gotten by starting our numbering on the right. Amines are another important functional group. An amine is really just an alkane that has an amino substituent, a nitrogen-bearing substituent. And again, this is going to be introduced to the name using a suffix, in this case, amine. We drop the E from the alkane name and simply add the entire word amine. So again, look at this first example. We go back to square one, find the parent chain. In this case, it's a two carbon chain, so it's gonna be an ethane derivative. And we can see that we have this nitrogen attached to one carbon. We numbered the carbons of the parent chain, starting from the end that is closest to that suffix modifying group. So in this case, we would number the chain from right to left to give the amino group the lowest number possible, one. And then we simply tack on the amine ending to the ethane name. So this is ethanamine. Again, technically one ethanamine, but most chemists won't say the one because there's no such thing as two ethanamine, so it's unnecessary. One of the interesting things that arises with amines as compared to some of the other groups we looked at 
is that you can actually have substituents on the nitrogen. Take a look at this example. Again, find the parent chain. Well, you can see in this case, we actually have two separate carbon chains attached to the nitrogen. We have a four carbon chain on the left and a two carbon chain on the right. So the longest carbon chain that actually is connected to the nitrogen is the four carbon chain. So this is going to be a butane derivative. And we number the carbons accordingly, right? We start on the end that is closer to that suffix modifying group, which in this case happens to be the rightmost carbon because it's attached directly to that carbon. So we can see that we now have a one butanamine. But we actually have a new substituent. We have this ethyl group, and it's not attached to the actual parent chain, right? The ethyl group is actually attached to the nitrogen. So the way we indicate that in the name, we give it a new locant. Because it's not actually attached to carbon one or two or three, it's actually attached to the nitrogen. The locant we use is a capitalized italicized N, standing for nitrogen. So we place that locant in front of the name ethyl, and so we have N ethyl one butanamine. That N, again, is a locant. It's, it's acting like a number. It's telling you where that ethyl group is on the molecule. It's not on the parent chain. It's actually attached to the nitrogen. We'll look at this last example. Again, always go back to the beginning of the process. Find that parent chain. The parent chain is going to be the longest carbon chain that actually is connected to the nitrogen. So in this case, it's a six carbon chain. From there, we number the carbons of the parent chain so as to give the amino group the lowest number possible. Remember, the amine is a suffix modifying group and it has preference over the other groups. In this case, we have a halogen, but that's a prefix group. So that means we have to number the carbons here from left to right. That's gonna put the nitrogen on three. If we had started from the right, that would actually put the nitrogen on four. It would give a lower value for the bromine, but that's subordinate to the nitrogen because the nitrogen is a suffix group. So again, we are gonna number this left to right and we can see that the amine is on the three and that the bromine is on five. In this case, we have two substituents on the nitrogen and they happen to be methyl groups. And we already know how to treat multiples of the same substituent, right? In this case, since we have two methyls, we're gonna say dimethyl. Now remember, every substituent needs a locant, even if it's in the same location. And in this case, those methyl groups are on nitrogen. And that means we use that N locant, but in this case, we need it twice. So we list this out as NN dimethyl separating the ends with a comma because they are locants. And of course we have to alphabetize all the substituents. So in this case, it's going to be 5-bromo-NN-dimethyl and then 3-hexanamine. When studying organic chemistry, we often need to know about the degree of substitution of a given atom or functional group. The degree of substitution is simply an indication of how many carbon atoms are attached to a particular atom. The degree of substitution can be applied directly to any carbon in a molecule. You simply count up how many other carbons are attached to that carbon. The terms methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary are applied. So here I've got some examples. This first carbon is considered a methyl carbon because it has zero other carbons attached to it. In the next molecule, the carbon pointed to here is a primary carbon because it is bonded to one other carbon. In fact, both the carbons in this molecule are technically primary carbons. In the next molecule, pointing at that center carbon, you can see that that carbon is bonded to two carbons, so it is a secondary carbon. The other two carbons would be primary, right? Because they're only bonded to one other carbon. In the next example, again, that central carbon, it's bonded to three other carbons, so we're gonna call that tertiary. Again, the other three carbons on that molecule are primary. Each one is bonded to only one carbon. And in the last example, that center carbon is quaternary. It's bonded to four other carbons. We often abbreviate these last four substitution patterns with the number and then simply a little degree symbol. So one degree, two degree, three degree, four degree, although it's never spoken that way. You always say primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary. Now, this idea of degree of substitution can also be applied directly to certain functional groups. For alcohols and alcohol halides, this is how it works. You simply count how many carbons are attached to the functionalized carbon, that is, to the carbon that actually bears the functional group, the OH for an alcohol or the halogen for an alcohol halide. So look at this first alcohol example. You can see that the carbon that actually is bonded to the OH, that carbon is bonded to one other carbon. So that is a primary carbon, so the molecule is referred to as a primary alcohol. Look at the second alcohol example. This is another primary alcohol. 
yeah, there's a tertiary carbon in this molecule, right? But when you're describing the functionality, if you're going to say, what kind of alcohol is this? What is the degree of substitution? We only care about the actual substitution pattern on the functionalized carbon. And if you look at the carbon that bears the OH, you can see that that is bonded to only one carbon. So it is primary. So we call this a primary alcohol. The last alcohol example is a secondary alcohol. You can see that the carbon that is bonded to the OH goes on to be bonded to two carbons. Therefore, it is secondary. So we call it a secondary alcohol. The same thing can be done for alkyl halides. This first alkyl halide is a primary alkyl halide because the carbon that bears the halogen is also bonded to only one carbon, and that means primary. The second example for an alkyl halide would be a tertiary alkyl halide because, again, the carbon that is bonded to the halogen is bonded to three carbons, and that means tertiary. So it's a tertiary alkyl halide. Now, amines are actually done differently. On an amine, you actually count the number of carbons attached to the nitrogen. And there's actually a really good reason for this. Let's take a look at our examples here. This first example would be a secondary amine because the nitrogen itself is bonded to two carbons. And that's one of the reasons why we actually do it this way because amines can actually have different numbers of carbons bonded to the nitrogen and still be considered an amine. That's not the case for an alcohol or an ether or an alkyl halide. An alcohol will always have one carbon bonded to the OH. An alkyl halide will always have one carbon bonded to the halogen. And an ether will always have two carbons bonded to one oxygen. So in an amine, it's a little different. You can have an amine that has one or two or three carbons attached to the nitrogen. So again, looking at that first example, those carbons that bear the functionality are actually methyl carbons. But in this case, we don't care about that. We're not looking at the substitution pattern of those carbons. We're looking at how many carbons are actually bonded to the nitrogen. And since there are two carbons, this is a secondary amine. Look at that second example. The nitrogen itself is only bonded to one carbon, and that makes this a primary amine. Yes, that carbon that it's bonded to, the carbon that is bonded to the nitrogen is a secondary carbon. But again, with amines, that's not what we look at. We look at how many carbons are bonded to the nitrogen and in this case, it's only one, so it's a primary amine.